SANS Certified Instructor. My name is Jessica Gallus of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for Justin and Ishmael, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Justin. Thank you, Jessica. So my name is Justin Henderson, and uh, this is part two of our All Round Defender series. Uh, I am, if, if you didn't catch the first one, by the way, all of these are recorded in the sans.org slash webcasts. So anything we have, you can access. Plus, we have a GitHub full of all of our PowerPoint decks. But uh, again, I'm Justin Henderson. I'm the author of 555 Sim with Tactical Analytics, co-author of 455 Sim Design Implementation. And then here with Ishmael, we co-author SEC 530, Defensible Security Architecture and Engineering, which is what this webcast series is all about. Uh, I'm also a GC. I have 61 certs, and I love you all so much. I'm actually sitting in a hospital parking lot <laughs> because my wife uh, potentially is going into labor and delivery. She's not giving birth now, but her blood pressure is high, so uh, we might be having a baby here in the next 24 hours. But it's baby number three, so I've got time to spend with you guys and Ishmael before I go and do that. <laughs> go ahead, Ishmael. Don't worry. If you gotta leave, just just go, right? I'll cover you. I'll cover you. I think you there have <laughs> very important things to to worry about right now. So my name is uh, Ismael Valenzuela, and uh, I'm co-author of Security 530 with uh, Justin. As you can tell, we have a lot of fun together, like sharing these these type of things because we actually love it, right? We love Blue Team, and and we love to to teach others how to defend all the things. Uh, I work as a senior principal engineer at McAfee. <clears throat> you can find us on, on Twitter. And well, I think this is part two, right, of a, was it a three part series? Because every time we get together to work on this content, we end up like adding more parts, right? It was three, it's not gonna be four, but based on the discussion we had this morning, I think it's gonna be a five part series. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now, right? Yes. Well, this so part two, this is what this is about how to mimic an enterprise <clears throat> like a network sorry uh, at home right and, and that's what we're going to be talking about the importance of having a home lab and and how you can how you can do it now uh, justin why 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 yeah, do you so I, like like and i and i think i think one thing that you and i are really trying to distinguish in this the series is we want to get you comfortable with things you can do at home whether they're you know, in your closet somewhere, on a laptop, on a Raspberry Pi, uh, with a low-cost cloud resource. This one is more on stuff you can do at home with equipment you have or can buy. Uh, but I want to distinguish what we mean by home lab. There's the home lab as in, I'm a hobbyist, I play video games, I'm cool, uh, and that's fine. Like, you know, I can monitor stuff. <laughs> and then there's the enterprise home lab, which is really what we're trying to get to. I want you to have fun with a home lab, but I ultimately want you to learn and stretch yourself to do highly complicated, uh, interconnected, multi-segmented networks, endpoints, you name it, because you learn, you get to be in new career jobs, you get better at the job you already have and love, and to be honest, all of these highly complex environments that you're working in are actually just a bunch of small, simple things put together. And when you build out your home lab for scalability in this interconnected design, you start to become the expert. You have a lot of fun doing it. Right. Absolutely. And I think we talked about this in part one when we talked about our how how we get where you know to to where uh, where we are now, what we do now, and I think in both cases, uh, Justin, for, for you and also for me, uh, doing home labs has been an important part of that, right? Like being able to to learn things, how to monitor your network, right? Yeah. How to do some of the things we're going to show later on. It's, the techniques are exactly the same, and we're going to show techniques that actually scale. So it doesn't hey, matter whether you're... I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but I would swear that half the time when I've worked for a company, my home lab was more enterprise grade than they were because I was <laughs> able to try new things 
where politics would slow things down. And really, I could show things I did at home to prove how we could do them in the enterprise. Though. Exactly, exactly. And without breaking anything, right? Without the, the yeah, risk yeah. of being fired. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally. Yep. And, and that's a very good point. Like, uh, sometimes uh, I see, and I've made this mistake before, okay? We're going to, again, part one, we did a lot of confessions. I think we're going to confess a lot of things here. I've made the mistake of mixing up my home network with my lab network. And yes, this this could be the same, but you know things can go wrong. And we're going to talk about the cost of building a, a lab or a home network. And you know sometimes you may want to invest a little bit into having a good operational uh, home network that you don't have to mess up uh, with every day. Uh, as I was telling to Justin before, it, it might be cheaper than actually going through a divorce, right? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at some point it's like, hey, I'm going to install a, a new firewall, honey. And, you know, three days later, it's like, oh, I'm still trying to figure out these rules and, and what's going on. <laughs> Not three days, yeah. but, you know, at some point you're going to have like your kids grown up, right? And and they, they need to have access to the internet and you can just like, you know, uh, mess up with the network every single day. So we're going to talk about what you could potentially use for your home network so you can learn, but something maybe a bit more reliable, cheaper, but maybe some commercial uh, uh, options. And then what you can do also within your home network to have a cool lab where you can just like mess up and build new things and you know break stuff yep. if you want. Yep. And, and here on this slide, what we're trying again, we're trying to show there's a difference between deploying a home-based lab versus an enterprise lab. And you might do both, because I've also been in where I've I've had my wife furious with me because I brought down the internet, which really mimics the work environment, because you bring work environment down, your boss will be furious with you. So you learn both ways, right? But we don't want a simplified lab that is good for home. We want an enterprise like uh, this diagram. If you look at the firewall, just imagine for a second this was what's called an open source PFSense. And, I, and I'm not saying that's what we're recommending, because we have a slide where we show like what we're personally using. But PFSense is an open source firewall. You can deploy it on just about anything. Uh, most home labs that I see that have a PFSense look like on the left. Yet a PFSense can do multiple levels of segmentation. You could have like your IoT home devices on one network. You could have your test lab on another. You could have mock workstations, your pen testing box. You could host web services in a DMZ. You could do SSL inspection, proxying, and all sorts of features. That's an enterprise level lab with the same piece of software. So th let's just let's just keep going with this because I know we have a lot of slides, but that's what we're trying to build you up to with this discussion. Yes. And and kind of carrying through this, this is a slide directly out of 5:30 of just one day. <laughs> well, day three specifically, we talked through all of these technologies, and they're enterprise like taps. You have. Network security monitoring, you have malware detonation, we have web proxies, we have next gen firewalls with SSL inspection, jump boxes. And the cool thing is, every single thing we have in here, even technologies like NAC and WIPs, and these enterprise capabilities are fully functional in a home lab. And you can pick them up and put them down as time permits. So don't don't get in the mindset of you need to be able to afford a million dollar sand to mimic an iSCSI NFS SMB storage appliance. And we really, and Ishmael can, and I can attest to this, we've had those things in our home labs for long times because we can do those type of things in an enterprise home lab. Absolutely. So we're going to look at some examples of that, right? And I want to show you, because we've been, uh, Justin and I, we've been working on a list and initially, you have a few things in mind, but then that grows right? <laughs> and real fast. Uh, a list of uh, things that we are using at home and, or that you can you can use, right? So we also asked uh, the community, Blue Team community on Twitter, hey, guys, what do you what do you guys use? And I have to say, it was one of the most popular uh, threads that we've had recently. And based on that, we we'll build this. Uh, you have the link on the slide. We're going to share this with you, right? So if you go to sec530.com home lab it will redirect you to this uh, github repo where we have a bunch of tools not only open source and free but also some commercial ones right we're not endorsing anybody okay we're going to talk about some vendors here some uh, uh, you know products that you can go and buy and we're going to say hey we use this or a lot of people use it
is why you may want to you know spend a few bucks on this but of course we're not endorsing anybody um, for network endpoint you know windows uh, services log management a lot of things many of these things are covered in security 530 but this is you know a very exhaustive list of uh, of things and i would say pretty updated so if there's anything here that you would like to see added to the list let us know right we'll be happy to to add that and we're going to continue to update this list throughout the series just because like uh i think the next series is going to either be cloud data or endpoint stuff uh when we go further into our list we'll add to this so this will this will continue to grow as well yep absolutely so let's talk about you know what we can do we're going to start high level we're going to look at uh, Justin's uh, lab. We're going to look at you know the lab that I have here at home, and and what the, what are the possibilities, right? From like limited money, almost like just reuse what you have, maybe hanging around in your basement or some legacy stuff that you may still reuse, to spending a little bit of money and and having something that might be um, you know more enterprise like. Yeah, and so here, this this is just me joking around. The home lab maturity money matrix, like <laughs> <laughs> money being what you're maturing off of here, by the way. So if you have a home lab, I don't want you to be discouraged that you can't afford to buy a server, a switch, a wireless access point, because quite frankly, back when I was washing trucks for a living and broke, I just had a single desktop. I didn't even have a laptop but I could still use virtualization technologies and I would spin up Linux boxes, domain controllers. And I had such limited hardware, I couldn't run like more than one VM at a time. So I ran one VM at a time and I still could test enterprise capabilities. And that's what got me my jobs initially. Even like you, know, you plug in a little $10 wireless adapter you bought off eBay and now you can do uh, monitor mode and implement your own open source WIDs and a Raspberry Pi, like what is it, thirty-five dollars for a brand new Pi Four? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's, I think it's, you know, it's pretty expensive. And, and you can get a, a used one because a lot of people buy them, never use them, and then they sell a box never been opened on eBay for you know, fifteen bucks. Uh, so like you can do so many capabilities: Docker, uh, Snort, Suricata, Zeek, all these things. Were some well, most of the things we're going to talk about, you could do on a $20 Raspberry Pi. Now, ideally, if you had a laptop, a desktop, and you could put virtualization software on it, well, now you can do even more. And the difference is you might not be able to spin everything up at once, but you're still learning. Now, Ishmael and I, and where I think you'll slowly push yourself towards, is you'll find that you want to actually keep these things running and interconnected. You know, that's what I mean by a complex interconnected network. At that point, that's where you ultimately have to you, know, you have to buy some hardware. And Ishmael and I will show you what our labs kind of look like. But even, let's say, $1,500, uh, my equipment at home is probably, is probably $1,500. But I can run over 100 virtual machines. And it includes a commercial firewall. And I have a very, very complicated lab with NAC and SIM and NanoSIM and so you can do these at varying cost levels, but you don't have to be at that level to use those technologies. That's, that's really what we're talking about. You're running VirtualBox. You're running VMware Fusion Workstation or Hyper-V. You can do pretty much everything we're gonna talk about in this webcast. That's Absolutely, and, and you don't have to go like one way or the other. You can you know, uh, have like a mix of open source and some commercial solutions. Like this is my my setup right now, and of course this is changing. It's been changing over the years. I've had like a lot of different uh, uh, home networks, and you know, in different places I've lived. And I had at some point I've had you know more space and had more stuff, <laughs> very noisy stuff that that actually drew uh, or consumed a lot of electricity. And um, uh, when I when I lived in Europe, that that was definitely a big thing. Here in the U.S maybe you know it's 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 cheaper so it's actually not that bad but at some point uh when i was living in in, in my previous uh, residence in, in europe i was like oh wow this is going to be very expensive to maintain and at that point you may just like go like cloud right and that's what we're going to be discussing on on part three how you can do um all of these things in the cloud but this is what i have right now um my requirements are 
I want to have reliability, right? Obviously, I want to run a secure network at home, but I want to have also reliability. I don't want to be, you know, reconfiguring my network every day or having to, you know, do like complicated stuff just because I don't have the time to do it, right? So obviously I see like my, my family, the rest of my family and myself, like my customer, I need to have everything running, uh, uh, well, 24 seven pretty much. And at the same time, I wanna have visibility, right? I wanna know what's going on on my home network. And I also wanna have the ability to play with stuff. Right? So we, we, you know, work on this, uh, many hours every day and we're always testing new tools we're always coming up with maybe you know new content for the classes uh, we have to test something so what do we what do we do well this is what I'm doing I have uh, I use ubiquity unify uh, there's a lot of people that's a you know big fan of these all the people that hate it they don't like it well you know from a security perspective it could be somewhat secure uh, you have to be careful with things like enabling remote access for example that could you know uh, expose uh, uh, maybe um, expose your network if you're not careful right with the configuration of the of the system but all in all it's a good solution they also have these um, all-in-one enterprise network appliances I think Justin is going to talk about his uh, flavor of this right what what he uses you, this is some sort of a SDN we're going to talk about software defined networking later on but see this as a uh, as a whole network configuration is essentially software and this allows you to create analytics and quickly see what's going on in your network right and how much bandwidth is being used per application per endpoint uh, and, and get a lot of the statistics out of that now in terms of visibility i also run security onion on this uh, intel nook i like intel nooks for several reasons first they look cool Power. right <laughs> right they look cool second you can run with them these are very portable this is like a thick book the hates canyon right it's like a thicker a bit you know bigger book this one the school canyon the one on the bottom it's super light like it's like a very thin book you can carry with you on your uh, uh, backpack if you need to go and do some consulting or you need to do some uh, analysis while you are i was going to say in the road maybe not for a while right but you can take all those these all of these VMs with you, and um, well, brand them. So here we're going to talk about segmentation. But what I like about this uh, Hades Canyon is that it has two network interfaces. So one is connected to my LAN, the other one is connected to a port on this switch that's mirroring all the traffic that goes up to uh, the gateway. So essentially, I'm tapping my outbound traffic. I can see all my egress traffic everything goes out of my home network. I highly recommend that you do that, right? Whether with a setup like this or with some of the other options we're gonna show in a, in a few minutes, but this is very important because it's going to allow you to see, to have visibility into all the communications that are going out of your home network. And this is a lot of fun, right? What are you gonna see? You're gonna see your smart things, right? your IoT devices, because we, we have IoT devices, right? Our home networks, sometimes they resemble what an enterprise network looks like. Connecting up to the vendors, looking for upgrades. Right? Your um, Amazon devices, your Apple devices, your uh, TVs, and all of that reaching out to get upgrades. And sometimes you will be surprised with what you, what you have there. And on this one, this is what I use for my labs where I can you know, break things. And even within this ESX server, that's something I'm, I'm using here, the free ESXi. This one only has one interface, but inside of this hypervisor, I can define as many virtual interfaces as I want. In fact, I have a PFSense firewall in here, and I define network, uh, different network switches with different criteria, different classifications. So for example, I have a management network where I put my systems are gonna be managing my servers. I have a like a DMC that is facing the out uh, um, the uh, the outside network, my outside network being my home network here, right? Um, my LAN. Uh, you can have another segment for maybe critical systems that you want to uh, put in there. You name it. You can you can play with this and do as you want. But as you can see, it's not a very complicated thing. It's not expensive to maintain, and it gives me flexibility there. Yep. yep. How about your network? Yeah. So, Andrew, by the way, I don't know if you know this, Ishmael, 
you can buy a cheap twenty dollar USB Star Technic for the canyons, and it'll allow you to have multiple physical networks too. Oh, so interesting. the reason I know that is I used to have three Intel NUC Skull Canyons, <laughs> <laughs> and that was my home lab. Uh, but the problem I ran into, and I don't think most individuals would have this, is I do a lot of heavy CPU intense analysis, and so the CPU core count was problematic. So what I ultimately migrated to, and I actually took a picture of these yesterday, so th these are online right now. The HBZ620, I have three of these. They're, make sure if you buy them, you go with like a dual Xeon. So this is 16 cores with 96 gig of RAM, and they're usually 500 bucks or less. Uh, and then I usually throw like an SSD in it. And, and I have multiple of these, because this is where I can run 100 plus VMs on these, and I've done it. And then I'll get things like, a, a, this is a Cisco 3750 switch for $34. Um, I have an Arista 10 gig switch, and I think I, I paid $200 for that. Um, why? I don't need 10 gig, but I do some testing for my workplace before we move things into our cloud um, infrastructure. So we host our own cloud services. But by doing this stuff, I can really run extremely heavy process memory, I.O., like uh, I'd have three of them so I could simulate things like VMware's um, software-based SAN, their vSAN. Um, and again, you're talking 1500 bucks for three of those in a $34 switch. And now you can do virtualization, enterprise-grade feature sets, uh, network security monitoring, SIM, and all these things. And it all fits on there. The other thing I do is I have, uh, I used to run PFSense, but I've since migrated to a FortiGate, uh, a low-end 50E FortiGate that I hang wireless access points off. And I do that because I get enter enterprise WIPs, uh, wireless intrusion prevention. I also can SSL inspect and decrypt back down to these HBZ 620s. So like Ishmael said, in your home lab, it's really important that you try to get full visibility. So one of the slides we're gonna have is we're gonna show how we use virtualization networking to see all traffic within the hypervisor but that doesn't help you for like wireless activity and IOT and things that hit your firewall. Well, I just have a, another cable from the firewall that mirrors traffic back into one of those hypervisors, but that sees all clear text and all encrypted traffic. That's why I went ahead and paid for a commercial one is I wanted those. Plus it can do some of the SDN stuff that Ishmael's gonna talk about. So there are a few exceptions where I would recommend commercial if your budget applies. But again, you don't have to have those things. So let's let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And we have more hardware options on the on the list that we showed you before. I, I actually had a few of these uh, Cisco 2640s, uh, I think it was. Um, and man, they're noisy, right? When they they turn on, it's like it looks like they they're gonna take off and fly yep. away from you. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you then have them in the bedroom, right? Unless you actually like that noise, and uh, it can give you you know some some heat as well. Yeah, the uh, HP is hot, but that desktop is actually server hardware with special fans to be silent, which is nice. Yeah. But the switches, yeah, they're still loud. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> so um, I think both you, you have this in your lab. I have this in my lab, Security Onion. Like, we both love it because it's the easiest way to get Zeke, Snort, or Suricata full PCAP which by the way, you can take that full PCAP and integrate it with your SIM of choice, like Splunk Community Edition, QRadar Community Edition, Elasticstack. Um, it's very easy to use. If you have more than one physical box, you can have multiple sensors and you maintain them centrally like you would in a enterprise environment. So I, I think I maintain one of the world's largest security onion at about 1600 sensors now. Uh, and that's just for one client. I probably maintain closer to like 5,000 of these. Uh, and I used to do military training and I'd have this running in the background competing against commercial solutions and it would outperform them. <laughs> so, and it's yeah. more about the individual tools than the platform itself. But I feel like this is a, almost a mandated, this or like a rock NSM. Um, there's multiple equivalents to this. But I'd say a security onion or a rock and SM is almost mandated in my book for a home lab. Right. Moloch is kind of a different flavor, right? Moloch is more like yeah. a, to have a, 
like um, a, a full recording, right? A, a full, as I say, usually like a CCTV uh, system with a full pickups across a very highly distributed environment, and it scales yeah. pretty well for that, right? Just for I, I think I, I like Moloch better for pcap, but I found it requires more hardware. So I would still do it in a home lab, but Security Onion or Rock and SM do get you full pcap. What they lack is a easy way to query the full pcap and extract what you want for like forensics investigations. Right. Uh, you can still do it in Security Onion, but it's your scripting. Uh, so I do agree, Moloch is slick. That that's true, and and it would be harder to have at home like such an infrastructure to support all of that. However, something I recommend if you're new to network security monitoring and you haven't ever uh, done this. Security Onion is great, right? Install it. In five minutes, you're going to see, assuming you have uh, uh, some visibility coming out of your switches, even a, what, a $50 switch that you can buy these days uh, can span a port, right? You can do port metering. So that's really inexpensive to see that. The thing is, once you've seen how Security Onion brings everything together, you know, the Zeek, Suricata, the nice dashboards, I would say go and build this from scratch. Yes. If totally you've read agree. the blog post, yeah, if you've read the blog post that we, uh, we published, I think it was yesterday, right, uh, related to this on the SANS website, we talk about the importance of building things from scratch. And that, that's how I learned. I've been managing these sensors, you know, for 15 years. Uh, so right now, if I'm going to set up something at home, I would just like, you know, put security on in there. I have everything I need. But if you haven't done it before, go through the pain of building every single component manually. And then sending these logs to an elastic stack, for example, or to Greylog, and, and try to build those dashboards in Kibana by, by yourself. That learning experience is, is huge. It's Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. Because as an example, I maintain Security Onion in about 20 different enterprise environments right now. Zero of those are the vanilla implementation. And mm -hmm. the only reason they're modified is because I've built them from scratch and I knew a few things I can tweak that will help the clients in different ways. And that's where I'm showing value add and you should as well. Plus you'll, you'll better understand everything anyway. So you, maintaining it, you'll, you you make your own judgment calls because you're, you're smart enough because you have experience. Yep, absolutely. All right, and, and Ishmael, I, I feel like we're gonna have to speed up just a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Because otherwise Here's we're not gonna have we're not gonna have time for any questions and we, we just have a lot of content we want to share. So oh, go man. go ahead, Al. What slide what slide are we in? Like eleven? Okay. Know. Yeah. So seek <laughs> we love seek, right? And essentially because it gives you visibility, but as we teach in, in class, uh Zeek is much more than visibility. It has an awesome correlation engine. You can do analytics, you can do a lot of things with this, right? But we're gonna show some practical things you can do with that. Um, Snore, I think it doesn't need any introduction, right? The IDS, uh, uh, the well, factor. I think we still should assume that we don't, we don't know everybody's background. So, I mean, intrusion detection system for the world, still the most common one deployed today. Is that what's in your lab? Uh, Snore? Yeah. No, I, I, you know, as a friend of mine would say, I don't snort, I suricata. So okay. I've snored for a lot for a long time, but yeah, once I tried suricata, I got sold on that. Okay, I apologize. I'm the same way. I was a hardcore <laughs> snort fan, but snort's dead to me. <laughs> Next slide, suricata, bring in the love. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I guess for me, I love suricata because it still works with snort rules. It has application identification that you can embed in the rules. Like this one is saying, show me any SSH traffic that's not on port 22, but it's via app identification. But I think for me, the biggest reason I love Suricata is it logs, connections, DNS, HTTP, alerts, all of this, and it ties them together with a connection ID. And that... That to me is an absolute game changer. Absolutely. So you're talking about doing something like this, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, a little <laughs> bit. So this is stock Security Onion. Uh, they have Elastic Stack, which is an open source sim built in. 
and they're doing Zeke and Suricata and uh, you could use Snore, and it would still work with this, and everything is interlinked. Uh, and in this case, the ID field is actually a unique Elasticsearch ID, not a Suricata or Snore ID. But when you click it, it opens this interface called CapMe in the top right corner, which lets you pull back PCAP specific to that connection log. And, and that this is the beauty of it. your enterprise home lab, is now you could have something like Zeek, which gets you logs of everything. Ishmael's got an awesome slide on monitoring his home network. Like, I can, who did this DNS traffic? Who's connecting to this web service? Who's connecting to these SSL sites? And you can see all of that with just generic Zeek logs. But now you have alerts from Snort or Suricata because their IDS is saying, this is bad. Well, you're investigating something that says this is bad. And what you'll learn in your home environment, which ideally is not compromised, is that there's a lot of false positives and you start to understand why. And that's that's where we, you're learning from this enterprise lab. But then you'll find, like, I don't know how many times I have found infected boxes, like, my wife's machine has had adware. It has had credit card stealers on it because she gets these ads. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that she's not a smart IT user. What I'm saying is malware is sophisticated, even for consumers. Like, it's an unfair environment. And so this is where even like I've seen where I implemented my Fortigate, my wife's problems went away because what was happening is she was accessing TLS encrypted sites. And all of my home stuff, sort of like a pie hole, was not effective anymore, which is an enterprise issue. I added SSL inspection and certificates and decrypt port mirroring, and now I could see where she would have been infected, hmm. but instead my new enterprise grade stuff stepped in and blocked it. Uh, and all this starts to come together. Let's do the next slide. And we have uh, in Script 530, we show a similar idea, a similar concept with uh, Evebox, right, which is another. Uh, interesting one, but hey, you can see Justin, you, you love dashboards, right? <laughs> you love your Elastic Stacks or Kibana dashboards, and that's pretty cool, right? But um, you know what? I I want to teach my 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 kids how to do this like hardcore, right? Uh, uh, how to you know grab and monitor your network like a caveman? Yes. So uh, here's a, a tweet that I put on on Twitter a few few weeks ago. Uh, talking about, hey, how do you monitor your home network, right? If you want to have full visibility, just put your security onion. Uh, this is mine running out of this uh, 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 Canyon, this Intel Nook. And Zeke will put the data on the Kibana dashboards, but you also have the ability to parse the logs, right? The raw logs. And since these logs are in this JSON format, you're going to need something like JQ. So it's a great opportunity to learn something new if you haven't ever played with JQ to learn how to beautify these, these logs and to parse them. So we actually have here a link to a great blog post by our colleague, um, uh, science instructor, Josh Wright, talking about how to do this with uh, uh, JQ. And here's an example of that, right? It's funny, like Security Onion, probably Doug Burks was uh, uh, <laughs> tweeting back, when I was your age, we didn't have fancy web interfaces. We had to grab our locks like a caveman, yeah. So I'm a bit Broke older time, than you, right? Justin. So. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Ismail uh, on his home network, right? Grabbing like a ca caveman, looking at what's going on. And I'll be honest with you, I was here sitting in, in my office in, in the basement and I have a, a big screen and I was looking at, at all of these logs live while I was working. And it's like, oh, so I can see, yeah, so this machine is checking, right? With uh, Windows updates. Um, some, you know, probably uh, Amazon stuff going on, the Apple devices, Dropbox, and uh, oh, so here's my son playing Roblox, right? I thought he was doing some schoolwork. Well, maybe I have to have a conversation with him. <laughs> uh, have you have you done something like this at, at home? Oh, yeah, ep epically. It's just mine's with pretty dashboards. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's very interesting to see because you'll see like. To me, like, for example, smart light bulbs and locks and uh, Z-Wave equipment, like, they should be very specifically only talking to certain things because they should only be doing the functions that I tell them to. Hmm. Uh, and yet, when you're monitoring them, you'll find some knockoff devices that you, me personally, you know, I didn't want to spend the money, so I got the cheaper equivalents. 
and then they they start connecting outbound and making some pretty sketchy calls and then you're like oh well i guess the, now i understand why segmentation was so important because <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not saying every, there's a bunch of malicious inv- things all over eBay and Amazon. <clears throat> there is. But it, it's at a minimum, once you start to understand your environment, what it's doing, you'll start asking more and more questions. Now, mm-hmm. this slide is super important because as Ishmael was talking about, he has ESX. I run ESX as well. Uh, ESX is great if you have dedicated hardware to your lab. Uh, if you don't, you probably, I, I like VMware Workstation and Fusion as my backup. Uh, otherwise, VirtualBox is free, and if your Windows Hyper-V is free, there's also um, Zen and uh, Proxmart. Like, there's a bunch of options here. The cool thing is pretty much all of these support multiple network segmentation with full visibility. For example, we both have ESX. And we have uh, VLAN 4095, which means see all traffic on the virtual switches right here. Yep, perfect. Yep. And that allows us, so long as the traffic is on the virtual switch, that we can literally see everything. Now, we are not monitoring, in this case, this is from my lab, I'm not monitoring vMotion, which is where it migrates a virtual machine from one physical box to another. I'm not monitoring my management networks. And I'm not monitoring my storage because I have a uh, iSCSI box set up. But in an enterprise environment, I wouldn't want to see those anyway. <laughs> and if you don't know why, monitor them and figure out why. It takes up a lot of bandwidth. Some of it, a lot of it's encrypted, depending on how you set it up. And you shouldn't see those anyway. But I do want to see all my pen test boxes, my IoT devices, my virtual desktops, my domain controllers, like that's all the stuff I want to see inbound, outbound, east, west. And when I do this, I see everything. Before this, when I would do VMware Workstation, what people don't re- usually realize is VMware Workstation, you can set up as many virtual networks as you want. And then if you were still running like a security onion, you could, what you would do is you would give it an interface on every one of those networks. And it could see everything as well. So effectively, VirtualBox, VMware Fusion Workstation, Hyper-V, ESX, any of those, there are ways that you can set up the virtual networking that you have full visibility on the physical box you're on. What that doesn't cover is if you had someone going through a wireless router or access point going to your firewall out and it doesn't hit your home lab. For those, that's where... I have like that $34 switch, or I have, in my case, the 48 firewall that will mirror all traffic going through the firewall that didn't come from the LAN port, my lab, back to me. I'll let you start on this one, Ishmael. Yep. So uh, the, the best thing about that is that it takes no time, right? It's super cheap. And again, you have all the visibility, right? Which is awesome. I've personally run all of these. Sometimes, you know, students ask us, what do you have in your home network? What firewall are you running? And uh, you know, a lot of people would just like have the, uh, the the router that your internet service provider gives you, and there is, you know, little to learn with with all of that. The capabilities you can find in any of these uh, routers provided by your I, ISP will be super super basic. So I highly recommend that you you know use something like PFSense for example, right? I've run PFSense home network for many years in different enclosures, like really cheap enclosures. Even IoT devices, right, or uh, in OT environments, you could have this, uh, put some Velcro and, and slap them in the back of uh, any of these uh, devices, and you have a, a layer three, layer four firewall with some layer seven uh, inspection capabilities. PFSense can run uh, Squid Proxy, can do SSL interception, can do a lot of things. You could even put Snort running in there. I don't recommend it, right? It's not the best way of doing it. Uh, but you could do it. A lot of people use uh, OPN Sense these these days. It's a very popular alternative to that. I have a feeling that Justin, you're going to talk about FortiGate, <laughs> and I will talk a little bit about the Unify um, as as you know as an alternative. Yeah, right? So I, I still like I FortiGate is my edge firewall now again because I want WIP wireless intrusion prevention commercially. I I can technically do Bluetooth scanning of all the I can do Bluetooth and 802.11 wireless scans because I went with commercial used equipment. Um, I have five access points around my house and property, but 
they're used, so they're they were super cheap. Um, and the firewall I can do. The main reason I bought the 48 was for SSL inspection with the ability to mirror the decrypted traffic back down to a network security monitoring system, which means I can see encrypted traffic for everything. Now, I still use PFSense. The difference is I use it as a virtual router slash firewall to mimic doing east-west access control rules within my virtual environment. Uh, right. Because I, you know, I would recommend in an enterprise you have at least layer four like routing ACLs, but it sure is a lot easier with a GUI firewall. Uh, so I use PFSense for that, and I, then I log and collect that, and it, that works great. That's awesome. Ishmael, you use Unify. Why do you use Unify? Unless I'll you show you the... Yeah, no, I'll show you in a little bit, but it's uh, I like the reliability. I like the ability to manage it from anywhere, right? And uh, because we used to travel a lot, <laughs> and um, and also the ability to uh, to get uh, reporting, right? Uh, knowing what's going on, and again, all of this you can do with open source software as we're showing here. But for my home network, I like to have that. But inside of my home network, I also run within an Intel Nook, this lab environment. And one of those VMs within ESX is PFSense. And through the virtual switches that I showed you before, I just define a number of interfaces, my management network, my um, red team network, right? But I put all my red teaming tools and the uh, different Linux distributions and uh, the other several simulation tools like the Calderas and, and all of this stuff. And then the victim network, uh, if you're going to detonate some malware, you want to make sure that that's not, you know, going out into your home network. Actually, I recommend that if you do that type of work, you go with a setup that we're going to show in a, in a minute. And maybe you want to have a dedicated line, right, just for that completely isolated off your environment. But as we said before, you don't have to go one way or the other, uh, either commercial or just open source. You can combine depending on your requirements and your budget to do something, something like this. And you know, PFSense is very reliable as well, based on OpenBSD um, network uh, stack, and, and pretty cool. But if you want to go into the commercial side of things and and simulate what a enterprise like software defined networking uh, um, architecture looks like, you may want to use some of the uh, commercial appliances that are available. What is SDN? I don't know if you've heard about this term before. But as Justin says, SDN is the new hot sauce, right? Put it on your lunch <laughs> sandwich and it's going to be awesome. So what is this? This is essentially putting the control plane into software. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be virtualized. The devices could still be physical devices. But the management, right? Or the, all the control plane where decisions are made, all that logic, it's going to be in a software layer. So that allows you to have APIs, to have analytics, to even build orchestration, right? And, and automate things based, based on that. So the possibilities are, are endless, really. So here's a little bit, again, we're not being sponsored by anybody. So we're just showing you things we like. Um, and I say it's cheap, cheaper, right? This could get expensive quickly if you get like, you know, into uh, uh, adding a lot of different devices around the home network. Uh, there's a very good link uh, here at the bottom, Troy Hunt talking about how he set up his home network step by step with uh, Ubiquiti a few years ago. But this is my my network. Right now I took a, you know, a few screenshots of uh, uh, some of the things I had uh, there. And you can see the distribution of the traffic per protocol, per applications. You could see the top applications. You could even do some asset discovery and see what type of software you have in your network. And you may realize that maybe you know one of your kids is using a vulnerable version of um, an operating system or something that they got from school that shouldn't be there, right? And you can you can see it. Or what is the client that is uh, uh, consuming most of the bandwidth? Right? Not surprisingly, typically it's uh, one of my kids watching Netflix all day long, right? Which that this reporting, by the way, is something that the family knows how to access this and. It, help us, like some of us parents, to have some conversations with uh, our kids about how to make responsible use of the uh, of the network, right? So that's that's one of the reasons why I like uh, the Unifies. Yep. And 
just kind of going back to if I have a PFSense, I don't know if the Unify does this, but like a PFSense free open source squid web proxy, they support mm -hmm. SSL inspection, uh, which is interesting because many enterprise environments wish they could do SSL inspection, but for politics or compliance, many of them cannot, which by the way, I think is the wrong answer. One, usually you don't have the same requirements across your entire enterprise. So for those that you can do it, you still should be doing this. Um, and you can make those exceptions, even in a PS sense. <laughs> uh, I went with a 48 so I could mimic it the same way you would do in a Palo Alto. A four, you know, 48 is a commercial firewall, a checkpoint, a Cisco ASA. And the concept is, you know, it used to be as long as you had private keys, you could decrypt traffic. Well, perfect forward secrecy and other, you know, we have you know new versions of TLS coming out. That makes that, eh, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't matter because with SSL inspection, what you're basically saying is you're proxying, full proxying TLS connections. So workstation connects to your firewall, that's encrypted, but it's a separate encrypted section. From the firewall to the real site is another one with the real certificate, which means you get to decrypt, analyze, and see the full payload. Right. Now, pop quiz, you have a layer seven firewall. At your, inter at your workplace, maybe you have one at home, but you're seeing layer seven applications, layer seven payloads with maliciousness, and they're encrypted, and you don't decrypt them. Did you catch the bad guy? No. <laughs> so we spend you know, tens, hundreds, millions of dollars on these really expensive next-gen firewalls, and then, sorry for my language, but we neuter them <laughs> because we don't let them see the traffic. So next slide, please, Ishmael. Yep. Uh, what I want to do is see everything, everything. Not only that, but I, I want to be able to block with antivirus rules, intrusion prevention rules, botnet scanning traffic, like all these capabilities next-gen firewalls have, SSL inspection enables that piece. What that doesn't give you, though, is detection-based rules. Because remember, a preventative control in an enterprise well, it has to be certain that it's bad to block it because if it blocks legitimate traffic, you're not going to use the product. What that means is it misses a lot of new attacks. So what I want to do is get the decrypted traffic out of the firewall and back into my network security monitoring devices. The reason I bought a FortiGate, again, it was a couple hundred bucks, but uh, I think it was 300. You don't have to buy the security services. It supports SSL decrypt mirroring, which means when SSL inspection occurs, I can decrypt the traffic down a mirror port to another box. That is why, that is ultimately why I bought the FortiGate. Also, it allows me to do overrides. I can say, when I go to my banking site, when I go to PayPal, when I go like, or I can do it per category, don't send like, I don't need to send my banking information to my security on the inbox. And I can make those exceptions just like you would in a real enterprise exactly right, let's keep going yep. i think we're down to a minute of slide by the way and so <laughs> here's the results this is me going to sec530.com which is encrypted in fact it has hsts header which forces encryption it's even preloaded which means even if you said http it'll forcibly redirect it to https actually it won't even redirect it'll just hit https even if you didn't tell it that's a cool feature we talked about in 530 and I can see the co the traffic in clear text. Notice the port's 443, but I can see the full payload. It's because it's been it went through a decrypt port mirror. By the way, if you do this enterprise or home lab, you need to make sure your IDS or network monitoring system sees 443 as HTTP because most of them by default ignore it because it's encrypted. In this case, you're basically saying, no, it, that's truly HTTP. Analyze it, please. And now, poof, you're enabled. Back in the back in the game, absolutely. Yep. Something else you probably want to have in your network is some um, sort of a sandbox. But if that's a requirement, if that's something you want to play with, again, make sure you don't shoot yourself on the foot. It's very easy to do this. And we're talking about enterprise-like environments. I've seen a lot of organizations that had massive problems with things like WannaCry, for example, right? Because somebody decided, or any of the SMB-based uh, worms, decided to analyze a sample and that sample escaped out of the sandbox because somebody made a mistake with the firewall rules. 
So be very careful with this, right? Make sure that this runs out of a completely segregated uh, environment. But something that happens with uh, sandboxes is, you know, malware obviously uh, is going to try to see if it's running out of these virtual environments, right? Uh, in Sec530, we talk about some tools, some of the things you can do to masquerade, to mask that these are VMs. But here's an interesting idea, since we're talking about home labs, and this should be something that's fun, right? Um, be creative. Here's an example of what you can do to mitigate that problem of sandbox evasion. It's an Intel NUC connected to a bunch of Raspberry Pis with an LED light that indicates whether the machine, the Raspberry Pi, has been infected already. That's red. Green, ready to infect. Blue, I think it was like uh, managing or the process of being re-imaged. The idea is you're going to install typically older versions of Windows, Windows 7 or Windows 8, on these different Raspberry Pis. And from the perspective of the malware, it is running on a full physical machine, right? Now, there might be other considerations like, you know, the size of the hard drive and memory and things like that, but it's something fun, something you can easily attach to a um, screen monitor and then, you know, play, play with this, build your own sandbox environment with something, something like this. You want to talk about NAC, Justin? Yep. So, uh, network access. No, no, baby, no baby yet? You're still good? No, it looks like they are going to keep her for a few hours and then induce her tomorrow, okay. though. So, I should have a baby tomorrow. All right. <laughs> baby number three. It's all good. We've been through this. <laughs> uh, so, NAC is a solution that historically has failed and failed hard because the implementations were too complex, they were slow, end users hated them. They're coming back again in 2019 and in 2020 because the solutions have gotten way better. In fact, Pack Offense is an open source NAC that I run at home because it it's, I don't want to say it's perfectly documented. It's well documented. It's easy to put in place. You can do a hardware managed implementation versus a uh, inline approach. So even if you ha don't have any special equipment, you can get this to work. And now I can say only authorized devices can get on my home network, specifically your lab environment. And there's Mac authentication, DHCP fingerprinting, there's certificate approaches. Like you can literally implement full on NAC. You can tie it into your monitoring system so that it's an authorized device, but now it's, it's looking weird. And so now you can move it around VLAN style or change access control lists, which goes into a lot of the zero trust controls you're gonna start seeing uh, you know, zero trust is a hot topic. NAC, to be honest, is one of the technologies you might own or could implement uh, versus a full-on super expensive SDN, which by the way, they're still super cool, but there's more than one way to input zero trust. This is the one of the ways I like to play with it at home. Uh, the next slide, if you will, shows kind of the home lab approach. Mm -hmm. I like to do the way you would do it in an enterprise, which is on the right, the out of band. What that means is your switch and wireless access points have to be able to talk to a radius device, the NAC box, and the NAC sits off the network, well, on a different network, and controls your physical networking. For a home lab, if you don't have switches or wireless access points that understand 802.1x or radius calls, like you're running a Netgear, a Belkin, or whatever, you can still do this. The difference is you're going to run yours as a virtual machine that is physically cabled inline, basically meaning to get to the internet, you have to route through the NAC. And in this case, it's actually way easier to deploy because you don't have to set up all the complicated technologies and it'll work. And now I can say, well, that's my wife's device or my spouse's device, allow it. You do, did you have a cert certificate on it? Is it via MAC address? Are you doing a DHCP fingerprint, which is way better than a MAC address? Okay, allow it. Printers, scanners, uh, it's a printer or scanner, categorically allow it. And, and you can start to make these rules in software and it takes a lot of the heartache out. And so that's one way you could implement Pack Defense as a solution. So, next and something I like about NAC is that, as you said before, a lot of people think about this as a protection mechanism, primarily, right? And you know, it has, it has access control in the name, so that makes sense but it's also something that can help you to discover what's in your, what's, uh, what's in your network. And 
there's no substitution to that, right? That's why critical security control number two, right? It's been about uh, one and two about managing or identifying what you have, managing the assets. So something, this is something I run in my, on my home network and something you can do as well. You can install this on a VM, on a Raspberry Pi. It's a new project by HD Moore, the creator of uh, Metasploit. And I like to use this for asset discovery. Know what's on my network, what, what are the services being used, et cetera. There's different ways in which you can do this. But one of the topics we also cover in SEC 530 is knowing the unknown, right? For example, we know we have IPv6, but we tend to ignore it. Why? Because we don't like the addresses. They're ugly. We can't remember them, so we don't. We, tr we prefer to ignore it. So for a simple question like, do I have IPv6 on my network? And what are the devices that are talking IPv6 right now? Because if you're not actively managing it, it could be a problem. That traffic might not be inspected by any of your devices, even commercial devices. So with Rumble, within you know a few minutes, you can install this on your network. It has a, a kind of a query language. You can say, show me devices that has IPv6. Pretty quickly, you can see, all of these devices are talking over IPv6 on your network. Another idea, I think Justin, you talked about Pi Hole, right? They released version five this week. I think today's what? Yep. 12, like two days ago or three days ago. Uh, on the 10th, they released this. And this is a great way to see if there is any DNS queries that are asking for a quad A resource over IPv6. So I'm running this on my network, by the way, right? Ads being removed for the win. That's awesome. Network will go much faster, except for those that are going through TLS, as Justin said, right? But here, what we're doing is we're looking for quad A IPv6 uh, DNS requests. And as you can see, these are being uh, blocked, but all this might be going through. You want to know what's going on. It's a way of doing that. And if you're like me and you prefer to do this like a caveman or a cavewoman, you can do this with Zeek. Look at the DNS log, right? And then do some grabs. Of course, grab is going to require some regex, right? It's a beautiful regex that you have there. <laughs> if you really want to have that uh, uh, ready to copy and paste, let me know. I'll be happy to, to send you that. But a quick query across my um, Zeek logs would show a three, uh, well, actually two different uh, link local IPv6 addresses. But you can find this in your firewall logs, NetFlow data, so both the 40 gates and also the uh, the switches that I have here at, at home, the unifies. You can export the NetFlow, right, and put it into a NetFlow collector and analyze the data there, put it into Kibana, a lot of different things you can, you can do there. And, and finally, uh, Justin, you want to talk about this? Yep, and just we're just piggybacking off your Zeek con logs sure. and Suricata flow logs. Uh, if your home lab has those, you don't even technically need flow because you see all traffic through those as your connection logs as well, which True. is kind of cool. Yeah. So the last one, I'll just kind of go through this pretty quick. Um, we'll probably hit this more when we cover a webcast on endpoint monitoring because uh, I think we're going to add to the series how to do, because I had a whole suite of things on Windows. Uh, and Ishmael, you had quite a bit of things on, on Linux that we're going to probably add another webcast on just endpoint technologies, monitoring, things you can do in the home lab around that, domain controllers, sysmon, things like that. But I always like to get all of my data into an Elasticsearch sim. Again, if you use Curator or Splunk, I don't care what you use, find something. Uh, and ultimately, that poses a new question, though in that in an enterprise, you really should have some way that when an alert is issued that you investigate it, an incident management system. Well, the cool thing is you, you can actually roll your own of that too. It's the Hive, but the Hive integrates to Cortex and MISP. And I have Elasticsearch in this picture, but it could be anything. And what you do is you send your alerts into the Hive, and when you investigate them, well, those alerts could have been created from a SIM, could have been created from uh, Security Onion could have came from Threat Intelligence and MISP. And so all of these feed into the Hive, and now you correlate that with Threat Intel, MISP, and you use Cortex, which is an automation framework for doing enrichment and augmentation. Basically, like let's say I said evil.com, and it would go find 
all this information about evil.com and append it to your ticket. It supports playbooks, all like it's it's pretty solid. And you can, you know, do mean time to detect. You can report on what's the average time it takes to close a case. Uh, it's very robust. So uh, this is something we can also put into our home lab. It's probably overkill for a home lab, but the whole point of a home lab, an enterprise home lab, is to be overkill. <laughs> All right, so we're we're down to the minute. Um, let's go ahead and close this up. So th this yeah. is based on 530. Uh, we cover effectively everything and a lot more. Uh, we have fantastic labs. We have one of the coolest coins at Sands based on Tyrell Corp. Uh, ultimately, I don't care whether you signed up for this class or not. Ideally, you know, Ishmael and I want that. But if you're just taking this webcast to learn and do an awesome enterprise lab, then I'm glad you're here. Uh, so the previous webcast we talked, we had some questions from the audience if we would mentor. In the next week, I will post something on Twitter or LinkedIn with a sign up to do a mentoring session because Ishmael and I care about you guys. I mean, I'm sitting in a parking lot of a hospital uh, because I want to attend this. I want these are these are fun, exciting, and the times are better than ever for you to be in the cybersecurity industry. I want to help you succeed. Ishmael wants to help you succeed. Um, we we said, uh, you know, we had a really good discussion on Twitter after the first uh, part, and everybody was like, hey, would you guys do this? And we got together and said, yes, we're going to do it. We're going to, you know, set up a, a, a an invite on the calendar, and we're going to share that with you guys, and we'll, we're going to run with it. So, yeah. absolutely. So, so we, have, we have three minutes left. I don't think we're going to open this for questions. Uh, I'm just going to close here by saying, and the next week, watch Twitter, LinkedIn for uh, the mentoring session will probably be a month out because well, I'm having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Need to be able to spend some time with the wife and the child. Um, but in the next webcast series, do you remember the date, Ishmael? I don't remember when the next one well, is. I'm in June, but let's let's do this. Let's follow up the conversation on Twitter, right? So if you guys have any questions, don't don't go with, with them, right? Just, just ask those uh, on Twitter. And we'll be happy to interact with you and respond to you, and uh, we'll take it from there. But yes, end of June we're going to do part three, and it looks like we're we're going to have we're going to be adding some parts to this uh, series. Yep. So with that, uh, thank you everybody. Love y'all, and um, give me at least 24, 48 hours if you message me. So you might want to stick with Ishmael for now. <laughs> and All right, go, go Justin. Go, go, go. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, there, Justin. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank Take you care. very much. Um, so people I see in the chat are asking for the Twitter handle. Um, oh, yeah. Let me put that. Be, yeah. So here, take a photo quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm security mapper. We should have added that to the last to the last one. There you go. So that, those are the Twitter handles. And yeah, feel perfect. free to ask. We'll be answering over there. All right. <clears throat> OK, perfect. Well, that's all the time that we do have for today. Um, like Ishmael has mentioned, you can reach out to them on Twitter um, for any other questions. Um, any other questions that you don't have um, that aren't answered that you would like to send, you can send them at q at sans org. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers, Justin and Ishmael, for that great presentation which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.